Hey everyone, welcome to the podcast. Today, I bring you episode 59, which will explore the final major group of land plants in the kingdom Plantea. These are the angiosperms, or the flowering plants. To recap how I've gotten here, I began this series by talking about the common ancestor of all land plants, which came from a lineage of green algae. The first true land plants to emerge were small, non-vascular growths of photosynthetic tissue, like the liverworts, the mosses, and the hornworts. When the evolution of vascular tissue created a major divergence in the land plant clade, the first lineages to branch off were the lycophytes and the ferns, all plants that still used spores to reproduce. 319 million years ago, there was a really big genetic mutation that gave rise to the seed, and then the divergence of seed plants. The first of these seed plants were the gymnosperms, which I talked about at length in the previous episode. Today, I'll be exploring the rest of the seed plants, which are the magnoliophytes, or the angiosperms, the flowering plants. The mutation event that led to the emergence of seed plants would create a lineage of vegetation that would grow to dominate much of the world. For more than a hundred million years, the gymnosperms were the only seed plants. They diversified into a huge range of forms, one of which was a lineages of huge trees, and these pushed out the lycophyte trees and the massive ferns that had lived in the tropics for so long before these seed plants emerged. They usurped from them the title of dominant tree form plant. These tree sized seed plants would radiate outwards and adapt to new environments, harsher environments with drier air, thinner soil, and colder temperatures. This gymnosperm party, where gymnosperms dominated the planet, wouldn't last forever. By around 250 million years ago, the gymnosperm ancestors of the angiosperms were beginning to diverge. Around 190 million years ago, I think 192 million years to be precise, there was another major genetic mutation that appeared, a whole genome duplication event that would give rise to the first truly flowering plants. This mutation greatly altered the seeds, differentiating them from their gymnosperm cousins. The mutation enabled the emergence of a reproductive strategy that involves double fertilization. Two sperm are released instead of just one. One of these sperms fertilizes the egg, while the other fertilizes the central polar nuclei and forms a triploid cell. The fertilized egg will grow to fill the inside of the ovary, becoming an embryo, while that triploid cell will produce a new structure called an endosperm. The endosperm is a tissue that grows within the seed, and it gives the embryo nutrients. The endosperm is basically a very powerful food storage organ for the young embryo. This little food source packed into the seed had major implications for angiosperm evolution, but I'll talk more about this later on. This first mutation event also led to a rapid emergence of flowers in the fossil record. So rapid, in fact, that early biologists in the 19th century couldn't explain how flowers came to be so widespread so quickly. Since the 19th century, however, the fossil record has been greatly fleshed out, and the story of the evolution of angiosperms has been revealed. About 30 million years after that, around 160 million years ago, there was another mutation event that further refined the properties of the emergent flowers, and created a lineage of flowering plants that would outcompete all of the other angiosperms. So 190 million years ago, the first flowering plants emerged. They diverged and radiated and covered a, a great expanse of land. But about 30 million years later, 160 million years ago, there was some major mutation within this lineage of angiosperms, and that mutation created a new lineage of flowering plants that would go on to outcompete virtually all the rest, and it would become the ancestor to almost all of the flowering plants that exist today. Some of the first flowering plants to emerge were the Amborella, a group so primitive that their woody vascular tissue has the tracheid structures, but it doesn't have the vessel element structures that exist in virtually every other species of flowering plant. 
The amberella typically grows a woody bush or a small tree, typically no more than 8 meters or 25 feet tall. It grows wide, leathery leaves that get up to about 10 centimeters in length. They have really weird-looking flowers, which grow layers of spirally arranged, flesh-colored, white-tipped flower petals. Another group of these early flowering plants are the nymphaeales, which are aquatic plants with herbaceous tissues and broad, wide leaves. They include genera like Nymphaea, the water lilies, and Victoria, which look like weird, super huge water lilies, but with entirely perfectly round leaves. The leaves of these weird Victoria plants form very wide circles, and they're bordered by an upturned lip of leaf tissue, so as to keep water from spilling onto the main part of the leaf itself. What's really kind of cool about these things is that the leaf itself is extremely fragile and easily torn and punctured. But because the leaves are so wide, they're able to spread out the weight of a large object that you gently place on top of it. These Victoria leaves can hold around 70 pounds before they finally sink into the water. There's another genus in the Nymphaeales family called the Nufar, which have really weird, small flowers. The sepals of the Nufar plants are relatively large compared to the flower petals, and so they grow in a large bowl shape around the flower. The sepals grow up and around the sides of the flower, cupping it and protecting it from all sides except for the top. As the fruits of the Nufar are grown from the flower, as it is with pretty much every other flowering plant, the fruit will develop inside of this little bowl uh, created by the sepals, so it's almost like this plant is creating a little bowl of fruit just right for the picking. It, it's kind of cool, but it's kind of weird. A third group of flowering plants, again one of the oldest lineages that were among the first angiosperms to diverge, are the Austrobaleales, which are a small order of about a hundred species of woody plants. A well-known genus within this order is Elysium, which is a clade including woody shrubs and trees that don't lose their leaves in the fall. They're evergreen. They're generally shade-tolerant and shade-preferring plants, and they have flowers that come in all shades of red. Pink, orange, red-orange, bright red, blood red, scarlet, you name it. The red-colored flowers of the Elysium plants, as well as their leaves, emit a very strong fragrance. All of these early flowering plants were some of the first lineages to diverge from the rest of the angiosperms, and as such, they're some of the most distantly related, genetically, to all the other flowering plants. And of all of the flowering plants, they're the most closely related to the other gymnosperms, or the ancestral groups of the flowering plants. These primitive groups compose the basal angiosperms. Their genetics and their physiology suggest that the flowering plants seem to have first originated in shade-covered areas with relatively high humidity, and the plants grew in soil that was uh, simultaneously well-hydrated and well-aerated. If you're wondering what kind of soil this is, this would be, uh, this would be terrain that's frequently disturbed by, uh, say, being on a mountainside or on the bank of a river, where the soil would be well-hydrated, but it would also crumble and break apart a lot, uh, just by erosion or from animals coming by and stomping on it. Uh, and th this erosion, this breakup of the soil, uh, would also make it well aerated. And so the hydration and the aeration was necessary to support these delicate, early flowering plants. During the time span from 100 million to 70 million years ago, these early angiosperms and, uh, and many other groups were outcompeting many of the lycophytes, the ferns, and the cyacids that were so widespread, and the angiosperms took over their habitats. Additionally, the ancient and powerful forests of conifers began to get pushed out of many habitats and replaced by closed canopy angiosperm forests. 66 million years ago, there was the KT extinction event, which wiped out the dinosaurs. And this was also able to push the scales in favor of the angiosperms and against the gymnosperms. From this point onwards, 66 million years ago, angiosperms would adapt and radiate and diversify really rapidly, with both woody and herbaceous species undergoing a speciation explosion. From the basal angiosperms emerged the lineages that would become the core angiosperms, 
which are also called the mesangiosperms. There isn't a single defining physical characteristic that sets the mesangiosperms apart from, uh, from their more basal ancestor angiosperms. Within five million years of their appearance, they had diversified into five major groups, the chloranthales, the magnoliids, the monocots, the stratophyllales, and the eudicots. These are the five groups of mesangiosperms, which all appeared at roughly the same time in the fossil record, because of their divergences all happening in such a relatively quick time frame. I mean, five million years isn't really that long of a time when the angiosperms have been around for more than a hundred million years, and uh, it's even less time when you consider that seed plants as a whole have been around for more than a hundred million years longer than that. The first of these mesangiosperm groups to diverge would produce a lineage that would later diverge again into the magnoliids and the chloranthales. The monocots were the next divergence, followed by the stem of the angiosperm lineages diverging into the ceratophyllales and the eudicots. Okay, so I kind of went through that a little quickly, um, but I'll go through it all a little slower, a little more detail, it'll all get broken down, and we'll explore the evolution of these five groups of mesangiosperms in detail. It'll be fun. Okay, so I'm going to start with the chloranthales, which was one of the first mesangiosperm groups to appear. And yet, in the modern day, the chloranthales has the second fewest extant species, at just 77. There's only 77 species of chloranthales plant spread between South and Southeast Asia, the Pacific Islands of Oceania, Madagascar, and Central and South America. These chloranthales plants are generally small, with soft woody tissue or green herbaceous tissue, and weird flowers that lack flower petals. Uh, you might think it's kind of weird that a, a flower would lack flower petals, um, but some of these even lack sepals. They, they lack almost all the leaves that you would typically use to identify a flower. Of those species that do produce flowers, they're typically very small and pale. These physiological qualities of the chloranthales flowers mean that to attract pollinators, the chloranthales plants have to rely almost entirely on scent, because, because the flowers don't exist, the flowers are small and weak, there's really not a strong visual cue. Pollinators aren't visually attracted to the chloranthales flowers, so the chloranthales compensates by making them smell extra fragrant. The next group of mesangiosperms, which are cousin to the chloranthales, are the magnoliids. The flower petals grow three to a whorl, which is called a, a trimerous flower, trimerous just simply meaning that each layer in the whorl has, uh, has three flower petals, and so you'll have multiple whorls all set within one another, and each whorl has three petals, each kind of alternating a little bit, offset from the ones outside of it, giving the whole structure a triangular aesthetic. Within the magnoliids, there are four orders, the canellales, the laurelies, the magnoliales, and the piperales. So to begin, I'll start with the canellales, which are a relatively small order with about 175 species. Some of these species are trees and shrubs in the family Wintraceae, while other species are in the family Canellaceae. These Canellaceae plants are typically small to medium-sized evergreen trees that grow in the tropics, producing bright red flowers and dark red fruits. What's kind of cool is that their leaves taste like pepper. And because of an organic chemical called n cinnamoyl tryptamine and other chemicals like cinnamaldehydes, their berries and their bark smell like cinnamon. Anyways, these canellales are most closely related to the papyrales order. The papyrales are generally smaller plants and more accustomed to less tropical, more temperate climates. Within the papyrales, there are three families. The first of these is the Aristolochiaceae family, or the birthwort family. It has about 400 species that are all characterized by strange-looking flowers and the toxic chemical aristolochic acid. Not all of the species in this order express this toxin, but those who do will use it to discourage herbivores from eating them. The aristolochic acid doesn't just taste bad to your average grazing mammal or herbivorous insect, it's also known to cause cancer in mice and it's associated with liver cancer and kidney damage in humans. Within the Aristolochiaceae, there's a genus called Asarum, which are small herbaceous plants that grow a single pair of leaves each year. 
As angiosperms, they also express flowers, but I kind of think their flowers are ugly and creepy looking. The Asarum flowers are nicknamed uh, little jugs, as are a lot of the other Aristolochiaceae flowers, because the petals are partly fused to create a deep cup, or a jug shape, with the unfused tips of the petals all tapering and twisting away like dead tentacles. The other two families within the Pepperellies include the Saruraceae, or the lizard tails, which tend to have white flowers, and the Piperaceae, which include almost all of the species of plants that produce pepper. The Piperaceae includes five genera, although three of these have an extremely small number of species. Six species belong to the genera Manichia, three species belong to the genera Verhulia, and only one species belongs to the genera Zipelia. The other two groups are the Peperomia genus, with 1,600 species, and the Piper genus, with 2,000 species. The Peperomia genus includes species with thick, fleshy leaves and short stems. These typically exist as uh, tiny, very compact epiphytes that grow in the forest canopy, growing on the branches of trees and larger plants. The Piper genus includes pepper plants, like the black pepper plant, Unsurprisingly, this produces compounds like black pepper. Uh, humans often use this black pepper in their food as a spice or as a kind of seasoning. Another order in the Magnoliids are the Laurelies, which is an older, extremely diverse clade, including more than 2,500 species of tropical and subtropical plants. Because the lineage is relatively old and diverse, there isn't a single criteria or physical characteristic that unites all of the Laurelies plants. Some examples of species within the Laurelies order include sassafras, avocado trees, and cinnamon trees. Where some of the Canales flowering plants have a, a cinnamon flavoring or a cinnamon uh, smell to them, the real cinnamon that we harvest and use as flavoring is produced by a handful of trees in the genus Cinnamomum. The last order in the Magnoliids are the Magnoliales, which is a medium-sized order including six families. I won't go over them all in detail because that would be pretty exhaustive, uh, not to mention exhausting, but some of them are the Ammonaceae family of tropical and subtropical trees, which produces a kind of weird, lumpy fruit. There's the Maristicaceae family, which includes the Maristica fragrance species known for producing nutmeg. There's also the Magnoliaceae family, which includes over 200 species whose flower petals are arranged in spirals, instead of being arranged in layers of whorls. The Magnoliaceae has two subfamilies. One is the Liriodendroidea, or the tulip trees, and the other is the Magnolioidea, which includes all the species of magnolia flowers. Okay, I know it's taking me a while, but I'm working through the core angiosperms one at a time. And now it's on to the next one. The Magnoliids and the Chloranthales were the first angiosperms to emerge and diverge, and they were followed in the lineage by the divergence of monocots. The monocots share features with their older cousins, like trimerous flowers and pollen grains with a single spore for the pollen tube cell to exit, but they also have several different features, including leaves that typically have parallel arrangements of straight, unbranching veins. These are called monocots because their seed embryos only have a single cotyledon, or a single developing leaf. All of the other core angiosperms are dicots, or plants that possess two cotyledons, two developing leaves in their embryos. You might remember that I mentioned an order of core angiosperms called the eudicots. Well, the eudicots are a special kind of dicot, and I'll talk more about them in a few minutes. So where a lot of the other orders and families that I've talked about have relatively few species, like one or three or six, or even a couple thousand, the monocots have them all beat by a lot. The monocots include more than 60,000 species, which also includes the orchids, which are the largest single angiosperm family with over 20,000 species. There's another 10,000 species belonging to the family Poaceae, or the true grasses. With such a huge number of species in the monocot order, it's not surprising that it's also hugely diverse. The monocots include not just uh, orchids and grasses, 
but also palm trees, onions and garlic plants, pineapple plants, banana trees, ginger, rice, wheat, sugarcane, bamboo, as well as numerous types of flowers like lilies, amaryllis, tulips, and daffodils. And this is just scraping the surface, because there's many thousands of other monocot species. Besides having a single leaf in their seed embryo, the monocots also share a few other features. They don't produce vessel elements in their leaves. They use flies as their pollinating species. They have multiple carpels fused together into a single structure at the heart of their flowers. Perhaps the most evident and widely known trait is that their vascular tissue in their stems is not neatly arranged. If you were to take a cross-section of a stem or a branch of a monocot, you would see that the vascular tissue, the, uh, the phloem and the xylem, is just kind of scattered randomly throughout the, uh, throughout the internal structure of the stem. This is in contrast to the dicots, where the vascular tissue is organized neatly into a ring along the inner edges of the stem. Many of the monocots are small and herbaceous plants, like your typical flowering bush plant or lawn weed. And this means that they have a limited size because they can't support a large, heavy mass. You know, they can't hold themselves up. However, a small minority of monocots, like the palm trees and the musacea banana trees, among several others, are capable of undergoing an anomalous kind of secondary growth that allows them to reach the size of a typical dicot tree. The last divergence in the angiosperms, after the monocots had diverged and begun their own radiation, produced the ceratophyllales and the eudicots. The ceratophyllales, uh, ceratophyllales or ceratophyllales, I'm not sure how you pronounce it, I guess either one works. Uh, the ceratophyllales order has one family with one genus, and that one genus only has four species, and so this makes it the smallest order in the entire group of angiosperms. All four of these species are soft, herbaceous, marine plants with small flowers and no roots. They grow in wetland environments like swamps, ponds, small streams, and slow-moving rivers. Due to their lack of roots and their marine habitat, they cannot endure drought. They cannot endure long periods of direct sunlight, and they cannot physically hold themselves up without an external solution of liquid water that keeps them buoyant. Now the eudicots are the final group of angiosperms, one of the two most recently emerged, and of all the others, they're the largest. Where the monocots have an impressive 60,000 species, including 20,000 species of orchid and 10,000 species of grasses, the eudicots have almost triple that, with something like 175,000 species. This means that the monocots make up about 20% of all the angiosperm species, while eudicots make up about 75%. The remaining 5% of angiosperms are all of the other little groups and orders and families that I talked about in the first half of the episode. First and foremost, the eudicots have two cotyledons in their embryo, not one like the monocots. Furthermore, where the monocots typically have trimerous flowers with three petals to a whorl, the eudicots have four or five petals to a whorl, so the eudicot flowers are a little more structurally complex. Where the monocots typically have leaves and flower petals defined by straight, unbranching veins organized in clean parallel rows, the eudicots have leaves and flower petals that have non-parallel veins that branch wildly throughout the tissue. If you ignore some of the other uh, minor species that I've mentioned so far this episode, virtually every other flowering plant species that you, can, uh, that you can think of just off the top of your head will most likely belong to the eudicots. This means that the eudicots are an extremely diverse group, with member species of all shapes and sizes, with all manner of functions, uses, and economic value. Some of the most charismatic megaflora are eudicots, including apple trees with their delicious apple fruit, and maple trees with their sugar-rich sap that gets turned into the syrup that you put on your pancakes. There's also the mighty oak tree with its dense, heavy wood, and the macadamia tree, which produces the extremely nutritious and economically valuable macadamia nut. 
Beech, teak, and ash trees are also eudicots, as are ground-dwelling plants that produce really large fruits like squash, cucumber, watermelon, cantaloupe, and pumpkin. The eudicots also include plants with smaller fruits like pears, peaches, plums, apricots, and figs, as well as the ground-dwelling shrubs and herbs that produce blackberries, raspberries, mulberries, strawberries, blueberries, cranberries, and almost any other berry you can think of. Eudicots include plants we often use for their scents, for their tastes, like roses, lilacs, jasmine, mint, rosemary, sage, lavender, sesame, honeysuckle, and basil. Eudicots include all of the potatoes, all of the sweet potatoes, all of the tomatoes, and all of the chili peppers. Eudicots even include a number of plants used as recreational drugs, including the tobacco plant that produces the tobacco that gets smoked in cigarettes, and the cannabis plant that produces the buds that get smoked in blunts, bowls, and bongs. As you can see, the eudicots are by far the largest group of angiosperms, with the largest, most diverse collection of different species, different fruits, and different morphological and chemical traits. It should also be clearer now why angiosperms are currently the most diverse and widespread group of plants on the planet. You might recall me talking earlier about how angiosperms appeared and seemed to rapidly spread and take over, usurping the position of dominant trees away from the conifers. This raises a question. Why, exactly, were the flowering plants so successful? What about them gave them such an edge and made them so good at surviving and reproducing and spreading out to outcompete other species? Well, it turns out that their most powerful evolutionary feature is also their most characteristic feature. It's the flower. But now the question becomes, what evolutionary function does the flower provide? Why was this quality, uh, why was this trait to express flowers so strongly selected for? The short answer is that the flower hugely increased the reproductive efficiency of the flowering plants. You see, the flowers have the same basic reproductive structure as the gymnosperms. They have microsporangium in their anthers that create spores, and these get released to become pollen grains, and they have an ovule that produces eggs. Just like the gymnosperms, the anther will degrade and release the spores into the wind. The spores will divide to become the pollen grain gametophytes, and these will start to produce sperm when they come into contact with an ovule. Just like the gymnosperms, the ovary will produce a macrospore that divides by meiosis to turn into a mega gametocyte. Inside the embryo is an egg cell and two polar nuclei, as well as three antipodal cells and two synergid cells. Uh, you don't really need to know all the details and what these things are specifically right now. You just need to know that the angiosperms have the same basic method and structures for reproduction as the gymnosperms. One individual will release pollen, which fertilizes the egg on another individual, and this fertilization produces a seed. So both the angiosperms and the gymnosperms have this same basic strategy. The only difference is that the angiosperms will surround their ovaries with attractive flowers. Imagine, if you will, that you're a pollinator, like a bee, flying around trying to get food for your hive. The enticing scents and the visual cues produced by flowers will attract you, and you'll find yourself landing on the flower and licking around for some tasty nectar. You smell the nectar, and you think you see it deep inside this flower structure, and so you struggle to grab some. Success! You get some nectar, and you're enjoying it. How good it tastes! But now, all of the nectar that you can easily slurp out of this one flower is gone, so you have to fly to another flower. You land, you get excited about more nectar, you dig around for it, you find some, you eat it, and then you fly to another flower. Rinse and repeat over and over and over and over again, all day for basically every mature bee in the hive. What the bee, or you as the bee, might not have noticed is that as you landed on a flower and you looked around for nectar, your little insect hairs were getting covered in pollen. When you flew from one flower to the next and you moved around as you searched for more nectar, some of the pollen that you acquired from the last plant is scraped off or shaken off, and it falls into the flower of the second plant or the third plant or whatever. You're also getting covered in even more pollen from this second or third plant, 
And as you fly from flower to flower, from your fourth to fifth to twentieth flower, you end up shedding all of this pollen and all of these different flowers all over a huge area. This is excellent for the angiosperms, because by doing this, you improve their reproductive success dramatically. Instead of relying on the wind, which at best is random and will randomly throw your spores at another plant, you as the bee, you as the pollinator, are able to carry pollen directly from flower to flower. It's not random. It's actually extremely focused. It's targeted and very efficient. Because the bee gets tasty nectar and the plant gets improved reproductive success, when everything goes smoothly, everyone in this mutualist relationship benefits. The fitness advantages to the symbiosis are so strong that all manner of angiosperms, and even a number of gymnosperms, have evolved a dependence on these insects or animals as pollinators. And many of the pollinators have in turn evolved a dependence on the plant's nectar as a food source. Pollinators like butterflies and hummingbirds are literally called fluid feeders because they feed exclusively off of the nectar that their symbiotic plants give them. There's another factor that improved angiosperm fitness relative to the gymnosperms. In gymnosperms, the seed is grown out in the open. There isn't an ovary to protect the seeds as they develop. They're exposed to the atmosphere. This is why some species of gymnosperms make cones, because the cones will protect the seed. The cones create a dry, hardened exterior shell. Angiosperms, on the other hand, grow their seeds inside of an ovary, which fully encapsulates the seed. As the embryo matures, the parent tissue in the ovary grows into pericarp, or the fleshy tissue of the fruit. So the fruit is composed of parent tissue, and it fully wraps around the seed, which is offspring tissue. So if you're holding a fruit in your hand, you're holding uh, the tissue with DNA from two different plants, from a parent plant and from an offspring plant. It's just that the offspring plant is still a seed. It hasn't germinated yet. It might seem a little odd for a plant to invest all of this sugar into producing pericarp tissue, but the end result is worth it. As you probably know, fruit is delicious. It tastes really good. Humans aren't the only species to realize how tasty fruit is either. Numerous primates eat fruit as a major part of their diet. So do many species of birds and reptiles who are known to eat small berries and other little fruits whenever they find them. Uh, even bears eat fruits. Bears love to gorge themselves on blueberries and blackberries. So with that said, you might be piecing together how the fruit and its really good taste plays into angiosperm fitness. Well, first, when an animal eats a fruit, it will often ingest the seeds. The seeds aren't harmed by going through the animal's digestive tract. And when the animal excretes the seeds with their waste, the seeds are now in a great spot to germinate. Presumably, the animal covered some geographic distance between eating the fruit and pooping out the seeds. So this means that the seed has a chance to germinate geographically very far from its parent plant. This is good because it helps the plant spread out and colonize new areas. Second, the seeds are now sitting in a pile of poop, which is excellent fertilizer. It's full of digested and decomposing organic matter, which means it's just packed with nutrients. In this way, the seed is given an extra comfortable starting position, which maximizes its chances at germinating and sprouting into a healthy plant. If an animal doesn't eat the fruit, if the fruit just falls off the tree and lands on the ground, it's not that far away from the parent, and so that's kind of lame, but the rotting fruit tissue will provide a similar little nutritional boost to help germination. So not only do you often have this fruit that provides just raw sugar and nutrient-rich flesh for plants or animals, the angiosperm seeds also have that endosperm, and that endosperm guarantees that no matter what happens to the seed, as long as it's uh, not physically destroyed, like as long as a mouse doesn't come and chew up the seed, that endosperm guarantees that the seed will at least have a little packet of reserve nutrients. And that'll really help it germinate and grow into a healthy seedling or a healthy young plant. Well, all right, everyone. I think that about wraps it up for today's episode on flowering plants. This was a doozy of an episode. It was really fun to research. Uh, it was fun to write and it was fun to record. 
Although it was also kind of difficult to record because so many of these angiosperm groups and genuses and families and stuff have really crazy names that are really hard to pronounce. But besides that, I hope you had fun listening to it. I hope I was able to fire up the engines in your brain and get you really thinking and interested in the flowering plants. On that note, I hope you've been enjoying this whole series exploring the plant kingdom. There's one episode in this series left, in which I'll be talking about the very long and ancient relationship between humans and plants. If you want to learn about all of the ways in which we use plants, be it for food, for textiles, for construction, uh, or for medicinal or recreational drugs, if any of that sounds interesting to you, then be sure to come by and check it out. And as always, thanks for listening. Would you like to support the Biologic Podcast? It's super easy. When you open a new episode, press the like button or share it with your friends. If you aren't subscribed, you should hit the subscribe button so you can enjoy a new episode every week. You can also peruse our official store, which has a ton of cool stuff like hand-designed t-shirts, hoodies, and stickers. All the links you need are in the description section below. 